Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another Novec talk. Thank you so much for joining us again. My name is Paulius. I am the managing director of the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. And today we will have a very similar agenda to previous occasions. I will give a very, very short uh, welcome as always. Then we will have our, our early career researcher for today, which is Bill and Piper from the University of Maryland. And then we will have our main talk for today, which is Professor Yan Chen from the University of Michigan. And at the end, we will have 15 minutes um, for questions. Um, just a small reminder, as always, that the NOVEC um, speaker series is organized by our Penn Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. We are a research center at the University of Pennsylvania that works with organizations around the world to enact positive behavioral change. We do mainly consulting, research, and training. Uh, you can see more information about us in our web page which is displayed on the screen and if you um, go to this qr code you can follow us on twitter about our fall programming so so we've had um, a few people already since september and before that since january um, so of course today we have professor Jan chen in two weeks, we will have Professor Marie-Claire Villeval. Um, then on December 9th, we are um, going to have our um, special event, which is the launch of our working paper series. This was an event that was previously um, canceled and we've now defined the new date. December 9th, it's also a Thursday and at the same time on the same link, everything. And then to finish the fall um, programming, we will have uh, Professor Stefan Meyer from the Columbia Business School on December 16. Um, we will continue the talks, of course, from January next year, and we will send you all the details to your emails. As always, if you want more information, please go to the website here or uh, scan the QR code. Uh, finally, a few ground rules is if this is the first time that you're joining, uh, please remember to mute yourself for the time being. Um, if you can, please keep your camera on to have a more interactive experience. Um, if you want as well, um, change your username to reflect your affiliation as well. It's always nice to know where you're joining from. Uh, for questions, you can either use the chat during the talk um or use the raise hand function at the end in the q a um, uh, section um we we will have uh, oigon as before moderating so um, he will be choosing questions and, and so on um and as always we are transmitting this event live on facebook and the recording of this talk and all our previous talks are on the website With that, um, I'm happy to introduce today's uh, Novec Early Career Researcher. Dylan Piper is a research specialist at the University of Maryland. The presentation is called Persuading Republicans and Democrats to Comply with Mask Wearing. Um, if you go to this link or, or use this QR code, you will go to Dylan's um, Twitter account. Um, to learn more about his research. Um, so let me share with you the video. Hi, my name is Dylan Piper with the University of Maryland at College Park. And today I'm discussing an intervention tournament that we ran to persuade Republicans and Democrats to wear masks. The study is a registered report under review at the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. 
As you may know, COVID health behaviors are split across political fault lines. Republicans are less likely than Democrats to think that masks should be worn in public. And Republicans also cite masks as one of the top most difficult or challenging aspects of the pandemic. So we built on moral foundations theory and other psychological literature on reducing political polarization to design our interventions. We first designed 11 interventions based on this literature, and then we pilot tested them, selecting seven interventions that were rated as the most effective. Our interventions um, had each a standard message saying the problem of COVID is such and such, and that is important to wear masks. So our control condition has this standard message in the standard image, as you can see on the right, highlighted in yellow. And then each intervention condition had a specific layer of reasoning for why it's important to wear masks, because it'll either keep you safe, the community safe, because it's our patriotic duty, it'll keep the body from being contaminated, it'll help reopen the economy, because COVID has killed so many people, and because scientific evidence has proven that it can prevent the spread. Now, some of these interventions were oriented more towards Democrats, some Republicans, as you can see with the blue and the red, and some we thought might affect both, which you can see in purple. So we collected data from almost 5,000 people using Qualtrics to match the US demographics and randomly assigned them to these conditions. Our dependent variables were attitudes, intentions uh, to wear a mask, and then also two proxies for behavior, signing a pledge to wear a mask and sharing that pledge on social media, or rather copying a link to share uh, the link to the pledge on social media. So our attitude variables were bipolar between unimportant, important, bad, good, foolish, wise, et cetera. And our intention variables were um, whether you would wear a mask in these certain situations, not at all to very much um, likely to do that. So we pre-registered all of our hypotheses on OSF and our materials and our interventions can be found there. As for our results, we found null effects for intervention and we found no interaction between um, the intervention and political party. Instead, we found a large partisan effect um, for political party such that Democrats are more likely to have positive mask wearing attitudes, intentions, and behavior compared to Republicans. Um, so you can see um, uh, on these graphs, um, the control condition would be compared to the rest of the intervention conditions on the X axis. Um, and then we have uh, the political parties in their different bars. Uh, we can see the same thing for signing the pledge and sharing the pledge on social media. Um, so none of these conditions worked. These interventions were not able to override that deep-seated partisanship on mask wearing. So there are a few possible explanations for these findings. One could be that the interventions were too weak and they were brief and in, in a limited context. So each participant um, was only supposed to read the condition for about 30 seconds and then move on to the dependent variables. The intervention could happen too late um, in terms of our time frame because political partisanship had already set in um, and so their fear cues uh, for COVID might have already been established. An alternative um, could be that other interventions may work, especially if they're stronger or maybe um, activate different search, uh, certain psychological mechanisms, such as empathy or thinking about you know, different beneficiaries of these behaviors to make it more personal um, and then also to establish you know, that strong fear cue. Implications for the study is that weak interventions, such as the one we conducted, may not work in strong situations. Future research should develop interventions that are strong enough to match the situation. Um, and we also uh, ask this question whether other scientists and academics would also overestimate the effectiveness of these interventions. And so we actually conducted a study on this, and Elena will be talking about this in the next talk. Um, so you can scan uh, this QR code and look at the abstract if you're interested in the study. We asked academics, practitioners, and lay people to predict the results of our study. Um, the following uh, slide shows our references, and you can also see the abstract of this paper by going to this QR code. If you have any questions for me, please send me an email and enjoy the talk. Hi, my name is Dylan Piper with the Great. Thank you so much to Dylan for the great presentation. So um, right. 
Yeah, so um, once again, this is um, Dylan's information. You can find uh, more about his research in this link or QR code. Um, I am not sure he's here today, but feel free to post any questions on the chat and we can, or comments, and we can transmit those to him. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce um, today's main uh, speaker. Uh, Professor Yan Chen from the School of Information and the Institute for Social Research at the University of uh, Michigan uh, with the talk, The Role of Group Identity in Fostering Political uh, for Polarization. Uh, professor Chen is the Daniel Kahneman Collegiate Professor of Information at the University of Michigan School of Information. She's also a research professor in the Research Center for Group Dynamics, um, also in the University of uh, Michigan, in the Institute of, for Social Research, and uh, is a distinguished visiting professor at the School of Economics and Management at Tsinghua University, where she directs the Economics, uh, Science and Policy Experimental Lab. Uh, Professor Chen has held visiting positions at Stanford University, UC Berkeley, and the University of Bonn, and is a former president of the American Economic Science uh, Association. So thank you so much, Professor Chen, for uh, joining us today. And I'm going to uh, stop my screen share so that you can share your presentation. Yeah, thank you. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for inviting me and for the very gracious introduction, Pallis. Um, So I'm going to present a joint paper with colleague, my colleagues, uh, Kevin Bauer, uh, Florian Hatt, and Michelle Kostfeld. So uh, the title has evolved over time. The current title is The Role of Group Identity in Fostering Political Polarization. Um, so this, you know, we, we all know that, uh, that over the years, there has been increased political polarization um, between Democrats and Republicans, and also from, the, um, from Dylan's presentation. Uh, and it influenced all aspects of policymaking. Um, and in the political science literature, people uh, talk about not just policy differences, preferences over, over policies, but also uh, affective polarization, which is people just don't like each other uh, that much. So this is the, uh, this, this well, paper is taken from Iyengar yeah. et al. Yeah. And yeah. it's from the okay. American okay. National okay. Election Study. Yeah. Um, so from 1980 to 2016, what you see is this heat thermometer, which is how warm do you feel about you know, the Democrats or the Republicans. So the green line is the in-party feeling. The purple line is the out-party feeling. And the, the black one is the difference between the in-party and out-party feeling. Um, and so what you see here is this is what political scientists call the affective polarization. So um, the difference between in-party and out-party feeling has changed a lot. And um, the, the conjecture is that it, it is an outgrowth of partisan social identity. And we're going to examine this uh, from a belief formation perspective. Um, okay. So we're going to look at how group identity affects belief formation. So, so if you think about polarization, uh, it has two components. One is information demand, and the other aspect is information processing. So we're going to look at both the demand uh, for information and also information processing. Um, we will also have an intervention which we call delabeling. There has to be a better name. So this is one of our debiasing interventions. Uh, and then we look at the robustness of these measurements. So we we uh, the whole the plan is to conduct three waves of data collection of experiments on prolific. 
The first wave was conducted um, one week before the presidential election in 2020. And in that wave, we measure group identity, political leaning, and we incentivize the participants to make three predictions. One is uh, who will win the presidential election. Um, and then there are two other predictions on unemployment rate in September 2021. So that's a year from, you know, a year in the horizon. And also the US public health system ranking by US News and World Report also in September 2021. So the second wave uh, was conducted in January, on January 31st, 2020. Oh, sorry, it should be 2021. Okay, here's a typo. So this is after the inauguration. Here we repeat the measurements and we also look at information processing in neutral contexts, you know, using urns and marbles, what, what we know really well, and look at whether these, this type of information processing is biased. And the third wave, uh, we just submitted the pre-registration last night. So uh, we hope that it will be approved in two days and then we're going to uh, conduct the third wave um, basically within a week. Uh, and so the third wave, you know, we pay for these two, pay the subjects for, for these two predictions and repeat our measurements. Okay, so, so this is an overview of the study. Um, um, so let me first talk about the experiment design. So what I'm going to do is to focus on the first wave. Um, so we pre-register the study and um, uh, we, you know, recruited uh, roughly a thousand participants on Prolific and they're representative of the U.S. adult population in gender, age, and ethnicity uh, distribution. So what we have done uh, in the first stage is to collect a bunch of pretreatment measurements. Uh, so the first one is what we called the minimum, using the minimum group paradigm. We randomly assign people into triangle circle groups and perform the other, other allocation game that has been used to measure uh, in-group favoritism in the neutral context. Uh, so if you will, this is people's tendency to make sense of the world through uh, group affiliations. And um, we also elicit you know, people's political identity and conducted a polarization survey, uh, you essentially you know, looking at using the same instruments as what political scientists have been using. Um, then for political groups, we, we conduct a, another other, other allocation game among the uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, which help us to measure. So this is a new terminology that we use. We used to call this groupiness and you will still see some of that. Uh, now we call it co-partisan favoritism. So it's a form of in-group favoritism, but in the political context. And uh, we elicit their prior on the policy statistics. So how do we measure in-group favoritism uh, in the neutral context? We'll give everybody $6 and we randomize them into a circle or triangle group. Then we ask them, you know, how would you split the $6 between a person from the circle group or and a person from the triangle group? And they can just, there's a drop down box. Um, they cannot give nothing to someone. Um, and then we ask, how about two people from the circle group and two people from the triangle group? And we know from past research that these are basically will give us 50-50 allocations. Um, then we look at their political identity. So we um, ask them whether they're Democrats or Republicans. If they say we're Democrats or Republicans, then we ask them, you know, are you a strong Democrat or a strong Republican? If they say we're independent or don't know, then we push them. We say, are you leaning Democrats or Republicans? So this is the Crenton et al. method. We basically force everyone to take a stand, um, but we do record the independent group. Um, then we look at essentially reproduce Peterson and Iyengar 2020 uh, and give them a bunch of true or false questions. Uh, these are factual questions, but political scientists have shown that there is a consistent partisan gap. Um, I am, I'm just going to give one example. So for the climate change question, it says over 90% of the climate scientists think that climate change is caused by human activities. 
true or false. And um, uh, the statement is actually true. And but Democrats tend to are more likely to think that it's true than Republicans. Um, whether you incentivize or not um, doesn't change the, the 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 partisan gap, but it just makes it larger or smaller. Okay, so we reproduce their results. Okay, and and then we look at a co-partisan favoritism measure. So this this is intergroup preferences in the political context. So again, we ask them to split six dollars between um, members of the Democrat group or members of the Republican groups. But the reason we don't call them Democrats or Republicans is because these are independents who are leaning Democrats or who are leaning Republican. Um, and then we ask them the same question among two Democrats and two Republicans. Um, so this, this gives us the measure for co-partisan favoritism. So if you assign more, more, more money to uh, your co-partisan, you show co-partisan favoritism. Okay, so it's a measurement. Then we elicit their priors uh, on three um, three measures. One is what's coming up right, you know, in a week, which is who will win the presidential election in 2020. And and then there are two conditional statements: uh, if Biden wins or if Trump wins, what will be the unemployment rate in September 2021? And we told them that the September 2020 unemployment rate uh, was 7.9% at the time. And, and so, so I'm not sure if anybody paid attention, but this was released in October and, and it was 4.8%. Okay. Um, and then we asked them if Biden or Trump wins, what will be the public health system ranking of the United States in September 2021? And we tell them that, you know, in September 2020, the US ranks um, 15. And we also told them that Canada ranked number one. Um, okay. um, then there's a, a, a task. Our main task is for um, information demand and processing. Um, so to do this, what we did was taking le the left-leaning news media uh, from the Washington Post, New York Times, and MSNBC, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we also selected three right-leaning news media, uh, the Washington Examiner, Wall Street Journal, and Fox News, and three sort of more or less neutral news media. So for the economy, uh, we take the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Associate Press, and the Economist, and for health information, we use Nature, uh, the Center for Disease Control, and the Economist. So we select articles from these different news media how do we select them? So they have to cover the same facts, but with different slants. And we also re, you know, take paragraphs and rewrite them so that uh, every article that our subjects read have the same length and the format and the transitions, except that you know, the excerpts from the news media are different. Okay, so, so is that clear? Okay. Um, then we have two main stages. One stage is called information demand and the other stage is called information processing. And the reason we use stage D and stage P is because the, orders, the order is randomized at the individual level. So if you're in stage D, uh, the information demand stage, you would see two article titles on the economy or health. And the main variation is whether we have, we show the label or no label. So I'll show you the screenshots uh, from, you know, of the, of the source. Then we elicit people's willingness to pay to read one of these articles. They start with 50% probability of reading either, and they have a $3 endowment, which they can use to move the probability. So uh, you can spend $1 to move the probability uh, of reading a particular article by 10 percentage points. And uh, notice that you can't go all the way to zero. Uh, this is for a better identification. So this is how, what the interface look like. Okay, so this is uh, the information demand for the health domain. Um, and we told them that uh, article one is curated from the following sources. So this is the one with labels, okay. And you see the title of the article, which is taken actually from 
uh, one of the titles. Um, and this is the neutral. Here's the title of the article uh, on, you know, what's the United States, what, what the United States might look like after the election for key health issues. And here you might not be able to see very well. Here's a slider. And um, you can adjust the slider. You can adjust the probability by using your endowment. And if you don't spend any endowment, the probability of receiving each article is 50%. Then we go to the information processing stage. So in this stage, participants see two articles on consecutive screens with order randomized. So we force them to read both the left-leaning news media and the right-leaning news media. Uh, we actually also uh, ask a review question, multiple choice question. We told them that you know if you pay attention, you'll be able to answer the multiple choice question correctly. And if you answer it correctly, you get a dollar. And, and the experimental manipulation is whether there's label or no label. And, and after they read these articles, we um, ask them whether they want to update their prior predictions. So, so we, get, we get their posterior, okay. So this is the uh, information processing stage. Um, and here you see the label, right? We say this article is curated from the following three sources, and this is about unemployment. Staggeringly high US jobless claims remain elevated last week. Um, and so this is from the Washington Post, the New York Times, and MSNBC. So this is the label uh, treatment. And in the delabeled treatment, you don't see the label, but everything else remains the same. So you still see the teaser. You still see the title and the teaser. Okay. So any questions about the design? Okay. We got no questions in the chat, Jan. Okay. I, I have a I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Christina. Uh, yes. Uh, um, did you measure the reaction time uh, when you know you look at their posteriors uh, between uh, uh, looking? Uh, so they see the label and they see the title versus they only see the title, no label. You yes. know the reaction time when they respond. We do. So we measure their reaction time. However, we haven't done the analysis of reaction time and we'll make sure to do it. Thank you. Thank you for um, raising <laughs> this, you. this issue. It, it might be really interesting to look at the reaction yes, time. It is. Okay, yeah. And so now I'm going to present the result from wave one. Okay. So first of all, um, more than half of our participants show co-partisan favoritism. The, the, the part about you know, minimum group in-group favoritism is not surprising. We just replicate the previous findings. Um, so how about co-partisan favoritism? So what you see here on the histogram is the dollar given to the in-group members and on the, vertical, on the vertical axis is the share of subjects. And so what you see is there's a, 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 you know, a bar at $3, so that's 50-50 division. Um, but then you also see a fair amount, which gives the maximum to the in-group member, or $4 to, uh, $4 to the in-group member. So we, we classify these two as uh, people showing co-partisan favoritism. Um, and so... We okay, so you know the the slides are not totally clean. We still call it politically groupy. <laughs> so people said they don't like the term groupy. So essentially, fifty eight percent of our participants are you know they show co partisan favoritism. In the minimum group context, using student subjects in the past experiments, it's about one third. One third of the people show um, co, uh, show, show in group favoritism. Um, a little more than a third don't discriminate and a small fraction favor the outgroup. Okay, so that, that's the, uh, the, the first one. Um, the second one is um, we look at who shows co-partisan favoritism. So what you see here is essentially uh, a visualization of, uh, of the, our two types of subjects. So the dotted line here are people who do not show co-partisan favoritism and the and the the solid line outside are you know people who show co-partisan favoritism, and 
how this basically shows how it correlates with a whole bunch of other measures. Um, it uh, first of all significantly co correlates with people who show uh, in-group favoritism in the minimum group context. Um, so so here's the the group of people who show minimum you know uh, favoritism uh, in-group favoritism in the minimum context uh, for for people who do not show co-partisan favoritism, and here's people who show co-partisan favoritism. It also correlates highly. These two types of people are very different in terms of regular consumption of in-group media. So this is from our survey data. Um, it's negatively correlated with regular consumption of out-group media. These people are also, uh, are also strongly identified with their own party. Um, Unlike Crenton et al., we don't see a significant difference uh, between Democrats and Republicans who, who are um, co-party favoring. And uh, in the Peterson and Iyengar uh, questionnaire for the factually correct answers, um, they are far more likely to have incorrect, but to, to show incorrect but party congenial answers, okay. Yeah, no, I, have a, I have a quick question. Do you have a, yeah. do you have a good explanation for um, this high correlation between groupiness and uh, minimal group sort of um, uh, behavior? Do you think this is like an individual trait that just correlates? Or do you think there's something specific about people just being more sensitive to, you know, being asked to decide between in-group, out-groups? Like, you know, is it something about the setup in which you present these things? Or is it something about the actual people in yeah. inherent characteristics. What do you, what do you think? I, I'm sure you don't have. Yeah, so we actually, we interpret this as a trait. So it's very much like the way we measure risk preferences. Uh, we, we can use risk, uh, think of risk parameters in lottery choice, in, you know, seal bid auctions, in, you know, a, um, decision under ambiguity and so on. So we think of this as a parameter. So um, a, as an individual trait. And uh, I will talk a little bit more about how we measure. So what we did in the first wave, um, in, actually in the first two waves, are um, extreme cases. So one can think of the minimum group as the really minimal uh, context-free scenario. And the political context as, you know, especially the week before the election, as highly charged context. And in the third wave, which we hope to, con to launch in two days, we're going to have a much more sort of in-between natural identity, uh, which is whether it's in, in your state or out outside of your state. Um, yeah, I, th I think one interesting way to probe sort of the robustness of this, whether this is really an individual trait, would be to see whether this carries over to self versus other trade-offs, right? So you do these interesting other, other trade-offs um and you know like in my trump paper i have the self other i don't have the minimal and the uh, party identity for the same people so i can't if i have this i could check that for you and then i could say you know what that actually carries over to also the self versus other right so it would be yeah. interesting to see is this really more uh because of the way this is designed to be other other allocations so is this really an individual trait that people just are more likely to discriminate across all, you know, variations of. of the, I see. Uh, yeah. So Sherry and I did that in our paper in the 2009 paper. So we started with this other other allocation, and then there's a whole bunch of self other allocations, in the form of dictator game variants of dictator games, and also uh, two stage sequential games. Uh, so yes, it carries over. To, so they're highly correlated. Um, and so this is essentially the same, um, the same information, uh, but using regression analysis. Um, and so what we see here, let me just summarize. So co-partisan favoring individuals are more identified with their party, are more likely to give incorrect answers to factual questions, um, but that are party congenial. Um, they're more minimally groupy and they consume more partisan aligned media. So everything that we observe uh, are highly correlated uh, with, with this measure what we, that, that we call co-partisan favoring. So now we're moving into, so 
you know, the, the previous set of results look at allocation. So now we're going to go into beliefs. So we first, um, before we give them choice of articles on uh, unemployment and health system ranking, we, um, we first look at um, their prior. And it turns out that, yes, uh, you see that in their prior belief. Uh, there's in-group bias in their uh, prior belief. Um, and we can control for various things and it's, it's, it's fairly robust. So, uh, and then we look at demand. You know, you start with a prior and then there's demand for information and processing of information. So this whole pump, pipe, pipeline uh, would lead to the polarization results. So what we find is co-partisan favoring individuals are significantly more likely to avoid out-group information and demand in-group news. So what we see here are, unfortunately, the figures are still labeled as non-groupy and groupy. So groupy means co-partisan favoring and non-groupy means non-co-partisan favoring. Uh, groupy is shorter, definitely. So in the out-group scenario, this is the co-partisan favorings um, percent of endowment that they're willing to spend in order to avoid the out-group news. And so the, these are for um, people who don't show co-partisan favoritism. And what we find that the difference is um, is uh, highly significant, it's nine percentage points. So co-partisan favoring subjects spent nine percentage point more endowment um, to avoid our group information. Um, and uh, the, uh, you also see a little bit of that between choosing between in-group and neutral, but the results are not significant. Okay. So this is one result, which is information avoidance. Um, how about information processing? Um, so co-partisan favoring individuals are more likely to process information in an in-group biased way. Um, so these, the results here are marginally significant. So conditional on there, basically the idea is after they, you know, for, we force everyone to read an article um, curated from the left-leaning media and also another article curated from the right-leaning media. So everyone's forced to read both, both, both articles. And we find that when it comes to updating afterwards, um, they're more likely to update in an in-group favoring way. And um, so, so, so the, the results are marginally significant, um, conditional in-group candidate winning. So, um, so for the information demand, uh, here is the whether you show the label or not. And here, remember, here's the, the sticker. Um, what we, um, so, so, so this is a, what, what's, what's called a, a, a Sankey diagram. So this visualizes how people um, update. So this is unemployment predictions by Democrats, okay in wave one. So this is conditional on Biden winning. The, the reason, you know, we can all, we also have the same diagrams conditional on Trump winning, except that we don't know what the grand truth is. Um, so we give them specific ranges of unemployment rate in September, 2021, and ask them, what do you think is going to happen a year from now? And people, 4% uh, of the people said, you know, it would strongly, the unemployment was increase, strongly increase, moderately increase, stable, you know, around, around uh, 7.9, you know, we would we, we give them the, the precise bracket. Moderate decrease or strong decrease, you know, this is good. Strong decrease of unemployment rate is really good. Okay, so here's the prior and here's the ground truth. So the green uh, check mark means this is actually what we observed. So unemployment rates decrease strongly. And so this is people's prior, and this is posterior after they read uh, the articles. The first thing that you should note is about half of the people don't change their prior, they don't update, okay? And for the remaining people, actually, so some of these uh, moderate decrease 
people um, moved here, some of the optimistic people moved up to various different slots. Um, but what's striking is after consuming the same information, here's the Democrats' prediction, and here's the Republicans' prediction. So first of all, in their prior, um, only 7% of the people believe that, Republicans believe that, you know, it would decrease strongly. 19% um, of the people think that it would increase uh, strongly. And again, most people don't update their prior, uh, more than 50% don't update. When they update, here there's actually a slight increase in the optimistic beliefs. Um, but the absolute value um, is lower than the, uh, the Democrats. In other words, when we pay the, our participants in wave three, more Democrats will get paid for the prediction about unemployment condition on Biden winning than Republicans. And for the health system ranking, it's exactly the opposite. Yeah, I have a question about the mechanism of the information processing. Um, if you go back, if you don't mind, two slides back when you show the updating, uh, sorry, one more. Um, um, maybe you mentioned this. Are you able to exclude that people, if they read sort of the news that they are not really interested in, that they just skim over that, don't really pay attention too much, and then they just they just ignore that information more? Are you Are you testing? The knowledge after they read this? Is that something that you're able to control for? Uh, so we have a multiple choice question afterwards, after they read the articles, and uh, we control for whether they answer that question correctly. Okay. And I'm not so, sure if that answers your question. Yeah, I, I no, that, I, that is the answer. Yeah, because of yeah. course part of the reason why they don't update is they they just don't pay attention to this other information, they ignore that, right? And so then they have no, you know, they don't need to update because they don't really expose themselves to that information. The fact that you actually ask for knowledge explains that this is not the case then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. So, I mean, another way to look at this is what Christina mentioned earlier, is to look at how much time they spent. Um, and there, yeah. there's a little, uh, yeah. Yeah, because uh, uh, I suspect that uh, uh, the people who, uh, basically don't process the information, the highest number would be the people that uh, uh, basically um, pay attention to the, uh, to the newspapers, to the media. And don't read, if I pay attention to the media and then I don't read, I don't care, you know, then of course uh, uh, my updating will be <laughs> minimal. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so there are different reasons why, why you know, we have more than 50% of the people who don't update. Uh, it could be that their prior is really strong. It could be that they were not paying as much attention as they should. Uh, there's a third um, explanation, which, which uh, our study is not, is not power to, um, to examine, which is to look at the vocabulary. I find this quite intriguing, but talking to my colleagues, in natural language processing, uh, they said that actually the vocabulary uh, in you know left-leaning and right-leaning media um, is quite different. And so, uh, reading the other side, news from the other side, actually uh, takes more cognitive um, resources. And I, I think this this is uh, fascinating enough that that there, there just should be an independent study looking at this. Um, so, 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 so that, um, so, so, so what we have is, you know, controlling for whether they answer the quiz question correctly and, and also going back to see the time spent. Uh, but, uh, I want to add something about, uh, I think is a great idea, but uh, it would take, uh, so suppose you are a Republican and uh, I give you a New York Times article on unemployment, yeah. uh, the not only the language, the words would be different, but obviously the content will be different. And it's not the content that I expect. And so in this sense, there will be a much greater cognitive load mm -hmm. for okay. a Republican leaning to read uh, you know, a New York Times article, which is not just the words, but the content is very different from what they expect. So there is a huge cognitive load there. Okay, yeah. We, we do restrict the content to be covering, at least covering the same facts. Um, 
but but with different slants. Um, yes. But we, we should we should um, we should check this uh, conjecture about cognitive load. Yeah. But note again, yeah, note that if you just look at timing alone, they could also be the confound potentially the other direction. That if you read news that you're familiar with, you might be skimming because you know that information already. So you're not skimming because you don't you're not interested. Skimming because you actually know that. So that could push. The, the time for the in-group message down as well, right? So it's not clear that you can distinguish that automatically. It's like yes. they might skim over out-group because they don't like that information. They might skim over in-group information because they don't know that information, yeah. right? So, okay. so that's, timing alone is not really helpful, yeah, unless you know the reason why they skim, right? So that's, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, let me just ask a related question from the chat, which was asked uh, whether could, uh, could the updating process be mediated by participants' knowledge about how the unemployment rate works? Um, it could, um, what, what, uh, I, I, that's, that's interesting. Uh, one thing that I would like to bring to everybody's attention is it's a really, really difficult prediction task. Um, um, you're, you're predicting unemployment rate a year from now. Um, and lots of things could happen. We give them a chance to update at the end of January, 2021, because there are major things. Ha major things happened. One is uh, a viable vaccine was a, was a, available and announced in December. And the second one is Biden became the president. And so, so, the, so they had a, an opportunity to to update. Um, and. I, I can show the results if we have time in the end, but but it is a very difficult task. And I think one thing that we could check is the Chicago panel of you know expert economists prediction of unemployment rate and see how far our subjects are compared to the experts. Yeah, feel free to continue uninterrupted so you can get to yeah. the other experiments. Okay, so I would like to Okay, get to our intervention, which is delabeling. Okay, um, it turns out that yes, delabeling has an effect, and it has an effect in information demand. Um, so delabeling the articles significantly reduces our group information avoidance by seven percentage points, um, and. Unfortunately, it has no effect on information processing. So people still um, still update in a partisan bias way. Um, so, so this just summarizes, um, you know, what's driving the uh, treatment effect on um, on information demand in terms of label versus no label, um, it's, it's completely driven by co-partisan favoring individuals. So these are the people who favor co-partisans in the allocation game. It turns out that um, once you delabel, well, you remove the, the, the news sources, um, these people are less likely to spend resources to avoid uh, group information. So I'm going to quickly discuss uh, the, the, the results that we uncovered. Oh, one, one thing that I, I wish I included, but I didn't, which is at the, end of the, at the end of wave one, and as well as in wave two, what we did is to design a whole bunch of urns and marbles tasks. So these are completely neutral. So this is very much like the um, Anderson and Holt information cascade task, except we use the simultaneous version. So we say there are two urns, um, a green urn and a yellow urn. The green urn has two green marbles and one yellow marble. The yellow urn has two yellow marbles and one green marble. We're going to randomly pick an urn and, and pick a marble uh, from that urn. And you're going to predict which urn it's coming from. Um, it turns out that once we remove the context, um, Democrats and Republicans are identical within one percentage points in the likelihood that they're Bayesians. Okay, so almost exactly 67% of the Democrats and Republicans got it right. <laughs> and 
um, over 80%, again, within one percentage points, uh, are consistent with Bayesian updating. So they're equally likely to be Bayesians in a neutral context, um, but um, in the political context, uh, they're very different. So what we uh, have um, measured in this, in this study is uh, essentially, uh, we would like to see how robust this is, which is a trait um, that we call, you know, in the, the, the large literature calls it in-group favoritism. And in the political context, uh, we call it co-partisan favoritism. It's a special form of in-group favoritism. Um, and we show that people who are co-partisan favoring differ in systematic ways in their news consumption, in their information demand, or rather information avoidance and information processing. And we had a simple intervention that we call delabeling. So we just delabel the news sources, teasers doesn't change. Um, and we show that the delabeling decreases the salience of partisan identities and therefore um, removes our group information avoidance. And so if you will, this is a very simple mechanism to essentially break the bubble. Uh, we tend to talk to friends who think, who think like us and uh, consume news that are aligned with our beliefs and a simple remove, removal uh, or de you know, decrease uh, the salience of, of partisan identities could um, decrease that uh, outgroup information avoidance. And what about the policy implications? You know, you, when you when you get your newspapers, you're not you're not getting it without the news source. Uh, one way I want to discuss is the um, Affordable Care Act, and um, there's a you know, if you want to enroll um, in this, uh, in, in, in the government provided uh, health insurance, you go to the official website and enroll. And we know that a lot of people, especially Republicans, uh, don't enroll. And uh, Lehman et al. looked at uh, essentially a delabeling version. So they um, set up a website called Enroll America, which is a privately run website. Uh, then they randomized people into the government versus the privately run website. So the government website, uh, of course, is there's a, a strong association with President Obama and Republicans call it Obamacare. And um, the private run website, can, you know, remove all associations with uh, political parties and political affiliations, they find a very large effect, uh, a large increase in enrollment for the privately run website. And one challenge for the uh, IT community is, is to come up with um, you know, uh, a news aggregator that makes news from diverse resources with different slants and without labels. Um, you, can, you can talk about, you know, we use news sources from uh, high quality, we use high quality news sources from, from you know, uh, diverse political spectrum. And um, they, maybe that's one way to help um, reduce the uh, polarization. So, so, so that's the uh, policy impl implication that we want to, we want to push. And um, I also want to talk just a little bit about, about the third wave that we're going to run soon. Um, we're going to look at the minimum and, um, you know, the, the political context, context again, just to look at the stability of the results uh, and, and use the, you know, measures that political scientists use for uh, effective polarization, such as the heat uh, thermometer. We also, it's interesting that the, the first paper presented by Dylan looks at mass wearing. We, we give them information demand and processing in the context of mask wearing using the Bangladesh randomized control trial. And um, uh, another suggestion which we incorporated was to look at this trait idea that people make sense of the world uh, from their group affiliations. So in addition to minimum and political, the two extremes, we are going to implement a measure which is, you know, 
allocation to people in your state versus outside of your state, um, which, which is not as extreme. Um, yeah, Christina. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think uh, you have concluded and uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk and really interesting research. Now, uh, two things uh, uh, strike me. One is uh, that the labeling uh, uh, the media source basically decreases information avoidance because uh, you know they have to read then they have to look at the content, <laughs> etc but not information processing. And this is very interesting. So they, they, in some sense, uh, uh, they are forced to look at the information, but still, you know, their priors, okay, uh, no, do not change or change very little, uh, which tells me something about uh, how the closing in of, uh, co-partisan favoring individuals. They really close in. They don't want to get out. And so in this sense, uh, I think uh, uh, the delabeling is an interesting, uh, is an interesting solution, but uh, I wonder, um, you know, the mixing news, for example, from different sources. Uh, again, uh, uh, there should be more analysis of the language of the news and what these news say, because a news from Fox versus CNN will use a certainly different language and will present the issue in a different way. And so if you are a partisan, you will discriminate and you know pay more attention to one or the other, even if they are mixed and even if there is the labeling. In the end, you know, they they will look for something that confirms there will be a big there is in all of us, but there will be bigger confirmation bias, mm -hmm. first of all, in these people. And uh, another thing that I wanted to tell you about uh, the wave three um, with uh, Enrique Fatas and others, uh, we have done a research in nine different countries uh, about uh, uh, the willingness. Uh, if you will, uh, to uh, practice social distancing, staying at home, etc., uh, related to uh, normaging, etc. But one moderator of uh, the effects of nudging people to do certain things is trust in science. Okay. And uh, one thing that I'm very interested, in, and you may add into your wave three, uh, looking at the different trust uh, differential, trust in science that these different groups have. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. And obviously those that don't want to vaccinate, etc., trust science very little. <laughs> yeah. They think it's completely bogus. And I wonder if uh, the more partisan you are, uh, you can measure, of course, trust in science, the less trust you have. Interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is just a suggestion, a but uh, I yeah. think it's very interesting uh, to, yeah. to look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's 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 great. Um, let me, um, yeah. Let me. So let me add two things, and then we have a couple of comments and hands up. Uh, two things directly related to what Christina just said. One, um, with regards to your policy implication, one of the challenges that comes from mixing and matching these news is, of course, that people can still probably guess the news source even if they don't know the label just based on the language or based on the way these things are presented, right? So this is related. So, so not only people are looking for something, they also know when they're presented with news that they don't like even without the label, right? So I think that's a challenge for even these mixing and matching type of procedures. The second one uh, regarding the trust in science, you mentioned uh, what Dylan presented in the beginning, part of the results that are found in that paper are also mediated uh, by trust in science. So in that paper about the, the nudging to mask wearing, um, uh, field experiment, we, we see there's variation in, in how uh, receptive people are depending on the trust in science. So, so that is related to, to that point as well. Um, now, um, let's give um, Enrique um, opportunity to ask his question. Enrique, do you want to just like ask out loud uh, instead of me reading it out? Yes. Yes, so uh, thanks for this uh, wonderful presentation, uh, Jan. So I have a question about the connection between uh, minimal and uh, political groupiness. I was very much interested in seeing the very strong correlation 
between uh, both uh, in task uh, one when uh, participants were uh, making a division of, uh, of uh, $6, if I remember well, but then you did not uh, come back to this uh, correlation in the other results in how individuals uh, uh, form uh, prior beliefs, how they update the beliefs, how they access information, how they process it. Did you look at that? Do you have any any uh, results uh, to share with us about the connection between minimal and uh, political groupiness in the, in the other results? Yes. Um, so the uh, let me let me see. Um, right. So here's the well, interesting. Okay. So political groupiness or co-partisan, uh, actually political groupiness it seems just easier to say. This is the dependent variable is, um, you know, being politically groupy. And here's minimum, minimally groupy. So if you're minimally groupy, you are 34% more likely to be politically groupy as well. Um, so, so, so that's, that's, they are strongly associated and um, um, we, um, we sort of, yeah, so we, we, we look at the, we look at the association, you know, this is the spider web, um, result that I presented earlier. Um, we look at the association and then for the rest of the paper, we just went ahead with political groupiness or co-partisan co favoritism because it's in the same context, but they are highly correlated. So we, we, we do have a Venn diagram that shows the overlap. So uh, of the people who are minimally groupy, two thirds are also politically groupy. Um, it, it could be probably very interesting to see if the, the same pattern is uh, uh, observed in, uh, in, the, in the way they, they I mean, they, they are interested in paying to get the information they, they are um, in favor of or how they update their beliefs. Because, I mean, this, this is a fascinating result. If uh, uh, robust, I mean, this is a very strong uh, trait, you will tell me, but I don't believe this was, uh, this, is, uh, this is new to me. I was really surprised to see this very strong uh, correlation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, thank you. So the, um, let me see if we have, okay. So because we, in all the regression good. analysis, we have, um, okay. So this is, this is one result where basically political agreement in political context, um, predicts in a stronger way than minimally groupy. Okay, so this, this, this table, for instance, demonstrate that. So what the dependent variable is partisan bias in the prior, um, in their prior prediction of these policy, uh, policy uh, statistics. Um, for political groupiness, no matter what specification you use, it's always strongly correlated with partisan bias in in the prior, um, for minimally groupy, yeah, I mean the 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 predictive power is lower. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Great. We have uh, two more inquiries. Uh, Chen Yu asked the question first in the chat. Maybe Chen you go first, and then we have Marco uh, with his question. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for a great talk, Professor. I yeah, just like um, as I put in the chat, I have a question. Okay. About um, since you already mentioned that the, the labeling intervention does not have really significant impact on information processing. Yeah. So I'm wondering, uh, do you know like how long the effect could last? Um, because I know you like asked a question right after um, right like in the in the survey, but um, given like the effect isn't really strong, I'm wondering like, do you have any like follow up to see? if this intervention could last or it's just a temporary thing? Um, so we don't know how long it lasts. Um, so the, um, essentially we look at, you know, so the intervention the nature of the intervention is that, you know, some people see the labels, they see the same content, right? They see the same teasers, same title, 
one of them have you know the sources the other one doesn't have the source and we find that people with the source with the labels are you know they're willing to pay more uh, about a seven percentage point more of their endowment to avoid to move the slider and avoid our group information um, I guess there isn't a natural context that you can just measure it after the experiment. We can repeat the same measure, right? And, uh, and see if, if they're stable. So I, I think stability is one of the concepts. It, but, but our group information avoidance is fairly commonly observed, um, you know, very early on in the 2008 presidential election, Lada Adamich has a very highly cited paper called Divided We Blog. And so she looks at blogging when bloggers refer to other sources, other bloggers, uh, who do they refer to? You have two largely separate balls, uh, one of them, one red, one blue. And so, so that, that is a, like a naturally occurring type of information avoidance. They're familiar with their in-group and they, they refer to them. Very few people actually cross across the aisle and refer to our groups. Yeah, thanks. Great, uh, Marco, go ahead next. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the, the talk. Uh, um, I mean, obviously, this is very interesting. And I, I wanted to know something that's related to um, what Christina and Eugen pointed out. So basically, um, like, there's like this layer of having like a label. And then there's also language. And I guess also interpretation of facts and so on, if you're restricted to the same facts. Um, so I guess vocabulary you could, in principle, switch on and off to some extent by um well like um seeing what vocabulary used in those articles is like the most neutral in a way um so you could classify articles by how neutral they are worded and then you could see potential and then like the implication would be that maybe if the new york times wants to reach like republicans then they should use more a more neutral vocabulary i guess Mm -hmm. And another way that would potentially be simpler, like for you, is you could ask people um, what they think um, the source is if you don't label it. Yes. Also, yeah. Like see whether um, basically something that you identify as clearly left leaning has like uh, more or less of an effect than like. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, I, you know, one way, there's actually a way to quantify um, the, the language similarity, which we use in other research, yeah. uh, other papers, exactly. uh, which is just the simplest way is to use the bag of word approach to use cosine similarity. So we just compute this cosine similarity between these three exactly. types of articles yeah. and 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 that will give us a, a measure that's fairly well accepted on the vocabulary similarity and we should definitely check that um and then the other one is you know will the will the content itself be sufficient for people to infer what, where it's coming from i suspect it is i think the title should just be sufficient and the fact that you know, they still see the title, they still see the first paragraph in the teaser and removing the label. Actually, I think that strengthens the result. Um, if they can, you know, just removing the label is sufficient. You don't even need to change the content. Um, I, I think that would actually strengthen the result. And so we should, we should actually have the raters go through that and see if we can, they, they can guess. Um, cool, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks. Great, so we don't have another question, but uh, somebody in the chatory asked whether you could um, indicate the citation of the Bauer uh, et al. 2020 paper um, um, as like reading material. You, you were referring to the Bauer paper, so maybe you can just put it up. You mean? Yeah, I don't know if that's, if that's the one that Tori was referring to. Maybe Tori, you can, you can uh, 
Hi, right. yeah, sorry. Uh, I think, yeah, one of the papers you mentioned toward the beginning in one of the first few slides about uh, information processing, uh, I think you might have put the link on the slide. I think it was one of the later slides. Ah, that's the one, just uh, back a couple. Oh, that was just the link to the pre-registration. Right? So oh, this uh, is the pre-registration. Oh. Yeah, this oh, is the A A A R C T registry. Yeah, so we, we do have a paper <laughs> that can be circulated is 110 pages long and we're sort of in the process of whittling it down um mm -hmm. and so if you email me i will i, I i'm i'm i'm, I'm uh, collecting a list and so what, what, once we have a, a more polished version i'll send it to you okay wonderful yeah. thank you so much sorry for the confusion no no thanks for a great thank talk. you yeah great. thank you thank you yeah great um yeah, I think we're right on time. I don't see any more questions. Um, I hope that was helpful, Jan. This was a great presentation. I've seen this paper now, different variations being presented yeah. and adjustments. And it's been it's been getting better every time. So so Thank I appreciate you you, yeah. you coming uh, to us and, and pitching this. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, Paulius, do you want to take it from here? Uh, yeah, I guess the only thing we have left is to thank uh, both our speakers for uh, joining, also the participants, um, and to tell you that please uh, remember to join us in two weeks for our next uh, Novak talk. We will send you, as always, um, the video of this talk and all the information about our next talk over email. So thank you so much and goodbye. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks for the great thank questions you, yeah. and comments. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.